Our scripture reading this morning, whoop, forgot to change that at the top there. It comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered round him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed Jesus and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She'd endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She'd heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk. She was about 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of God's word. So our story, our scripture reading this morning is really a story within a story. Three characters, three needs, Three stories to tell and the one Jesus who comes. The first character, we have his name, Jairus. And we are given his occupation and his status, a leader in the synagogue. The thing about leaders is we are trained to be competent, to know what to do, to guide others when something needs to be done, to keep it together. And so we could only read between the lines for Jairus as he finds himself without an answer without a plan, without a way forward. You see, his 12-year-old daughter is sick, really sick, close to dying. And as a parent, I can only imagine that is what sent this accomplished man running to Jesus, falling at his feet, begging him to come to her aid. His love for his daughter has left him completely raw and vulnerable. Well, the story then shifts to the crowd gathered around Jesus, and we meet the second character. And this woman, well, she has no name. And we're not given her occupation, though we can presume her status. She's not a leader and has no one to advocate for her. With her issue of blood, actually, she is an outcast. She is untouchable. Sarah Jackson says, it makes me wonder 
about the ongoing reactions of those in the community who have taught her such terror. But she, like Jairus, finds herself fraught and vulnerable, and she too falls at Jesus' feet only to touch the cloak of a healer in the desperate hope that that touch might do something. And then there is the little girl. It's easy to forget about her. We aren't given her name, just that she's 12 years old, which tells us that she's on the cusp of puberty and the gateway to adulthood, the edge of her life just opening up, and yet she may never see it. She too is vulnerable, maybe the most vulnerable, as a child and on the brink of death, but she is in no place to do anything about it. Three characters, three needs, three stories to tell, and Jesus who heals. Each in their own way is vulnerable. Each in their own way is desperate. And this morning, I wonder how you might connect with one of these characters on this cool June day. Because somewhere deep, we're all in need of healing. We could be like Jairus, needing to keep up appearances for the sake of others, and yet inside, we're struggling. Could be with low self-esteem or an illness no one knows about, or depression or loneliness. We could be like the woman who fell on Jesus in the crowd, desperate enough, but unable to speak our need just that we must access some kind of hope. Or we could be utterly dependent on others, finding ourselves at the mercy of another's kindness, like the little girl. So I wonder, which do you identify with? Which one does your friend in the pew or your neighbor back at home identify with? You see, in the quiet, desperate places of the heart, we live this story on some level. It's like what Yeats said in his poem, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And we know that somehow connecting with Jesus, with God, with the source of our being can restore us. Touching the hem of God, maybe the center can hold. But there's a great danger in stories like these we are well aware because we know of many more that don't end well. We live with the tragic fact that children die every day. We love, lose loved ones even when we have prayed to God with everything we have. Healing is so much more than what happens to us physically. We know this on an intellectual level. We can know that God answers prayers even when we don't get the outcome we wanted. And sometimes, sometimes we can even accept that. We can understand that healing might mean acceptance as much as it means a cure. But on an emotional, visceral level, sometimes, sometimes stories like these are hard to take. Because in the many times, physical healing doesn't happen. And we have to deal with the very real, very raw grief in those times. I honestly don't know what to do with miracles in the Bible. Because from my very limited point of view, it's hard to see the huge mountain of loss and grief and illness that have stricken very good, very loving, caring, and general people, generous people stacked up against the infinitesimally small pile of miracles. At least I've seen it. The thing is, as Barbara Brown Taylor puts it, the problem with miracles is that it's hard to witness them without wanting one of your own. We all know people who are suffering and who, from our point of view, deserve a miracle. And we witness people who, again, from our perspective, don't deserve one. And we want to know what the trick is. We somehow think we can influence cajole, pray a miracle out of God. And if we did it just right, we would get what we want. Unwittingly, we carry this burden, and we put it on other people too. 
that we are responsible for our healing. We are responsible for the miracles. And if we don't get it, we must be doing something wrong. We aren't praying right. We aren't meditating right. We must have done something wrong to deserve that suffering. We think mistakenly that faith creates miracles. As hard as it is to hear, faith does not create miracles. It only helps us to see the ones right before us. The thing is, we want to control what happens. We want our perceived goodness and efforts and faith to count for something. Except that's not how it works. Grace is an unmerited gift. You can't work for it, it just comes. And the weird thing is, it comes in all sorts of different ways. Sometimes it defies all logic and looks like what we would traditionally call a miracle. And sometimes it doesn't result in a cure or recovery, but looks like a life lived with peace and acceptance and graceful living in spite of some of the most devastating circumstances. Those are miracles too. The thing is, faith helps us to see differently. And so I believe that there is power in faith, grasping at the hem of God. In the act of reaching out, God hears our need and blessing is sent. It flows in waves of love from friends, compassionate nod of recognition from a stranger, in the seeming serendipitous call to see how you're holding up. Listen, Jairus asked for help. The woman reached out silently, unable to ask. The daughter couldn't even ask for herself, but someone else did. And yet the powerful blessing of God flowed out. Friends, these characters three are you and me. I don't know what exactly you're desperate over, but I'm sure that something in you is longing for healing. So today, let us make a covenant and promise to each other to be the kind of community that accepts each other's limitations and honors vulnerability. That we will carry each other in a light that will not judge, but will hold us where we are and with God. Let us make mistakes and learn and grow toward who God is calling us to become. May this be a place where we can come and kneel at the hem of God and claim our place as God's children with our vulnerability and fear, our dreams and our disappointments. Because you know what? That's exactly how we will learn to share God's amazing grace and unfailing love and unrelenting mercy, bringing healing in the places that need it most. Amen.